Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today I'm going to have a look at Charonism. He's got a video out that talks about the various falsities of the globe proofs. So let's go ahead and go through them and see what he has to say. The uh, nonsense that we're given and taught and fed and forced to believe. My whole thing was I was going to agree to start over. And uh, one of my rules was to remain a student no matter what. So in my videos, if you do see something you don't agree with or you don't believe or you have evidence against, comment and bring your evidence and let's talk about it. I'm willing to learn, willing to change my mind at any point. Well, Jared, that's a great attitude to have. We're all students throughout our lives and we can always learn more from people who know more than we do. The thing that concerns me though is why did you have to add the qualifier according to your perception? One of the first things that we learned in middle school in science was that our perception can be fooled. We can't accurately look at something and tell to the millimeter how far away it is or, or to the gram what it weighs. That's why we have instruments. We have mathematics. We have ways of extending our senses. And I think that if you're going to seriously study science, you have to be able to extend your senses a little bit. So don't bring me any of that stupid gravity bullshit that doesn't work and Number one, it's impossible. Uh, number two, it can't be shown to be true. Uh, you're telling me the same force that keeps my feet glued to the Earth's surface also keeps the moon in orbit around the Earth, keeps us in orbit around the sun. That right there makes no sense. Well, this is a little concerning, Jared, because in order to really understand things, you have to be open to ideas maybe that you don't know very much about gravity being one of them. So to answer your question, yes, the same gravity that keeps us on the Earth is what keeps the moon in orbit. So let's get into some of the proofs. First we got your magical spinning ball of fun on the screen and you'll notice that it is the winter and so the southern tip or Antarctica is pointed directly at the Sun where it remains for the entire six months as the Earth processes around the Sun. So does anybody else realize that the tops and bottom of the globe would be where the ice caps are? Your up? next question confused me a little bit. I think this is what you're getting at. If this is the North Pole right here, and this is the equator coming around here, if the Sun is directly right. over the equator as it is on the equinox, it would be the same distance from the North Pole to the South Pole to the Sun. As a result, the polar ice caps would be about the same size. Now, here's where I got a little bit confused. Are you suggesting that because the Earth is tilted, the ice cap should tilt up from the North Pole up to Canada? Well, Jared, your question on how water drains north and south of the equator, um, well, it's interesting. It's interesting because it seems that you seem to believe that the way water drains depends on where the sun is. It doesn't. Water drains based on something called the Coriolis effect. And that has to do with the rotation of the earth on its axis. So it doesn't matter where the sun is or if it's at night. Water in the northern hemisphere will swirl counterclockwise, and water in the southern hemisphere will swirl clockwise. So will tropical storms around low pressure centers. Take a look now, and you'll see this is where the ice caps would be if the Earth was really on a tilt. And you'll see the red line, which represents the tilt, is where the ice caps are now, pointed directly at the sun. Makes a lot of sense, I guess, if you're... Stupid. I guess. Okay, I think one of the problems here with this ice cap question is just basically a misunderstanding of how the sun and the ice caps even work. Now, on the equinox, which is in uh, March and September, the sun is directly over the equator. And here's the sun out here. Okay? Now, in June, the path of the sun moves up 23 and a half degrees to what they call the Tropic of Cancer and it's out in that direction. In December it comes down to the Tropic of Capricorn and it's straight out there. Okay? Now, 
Going back to the equinox when the sun is directly over the equator, this side of the earth will be lit. And the terminus line, which is at a right angle to the direction to the sun, go through the North Pole and the South Pole. In June, when the sun's coming up this way, the terminator line will be out here 23 degrees off of the North Pole or at 66.5 degrees. And the other half of it will be down there. So all of this area here will be in sunlight. Now, conversely, in December, the sun's down here, so the terminator line is out here. Again, 23 degrees off of 90 degrees south. Now, everything south of this line, 66 and a half degrees south, will be in 24-hour daylight. This is the Arctic Circle. This is the Antarctic Circle. The poles and the polar cap will always be up around the Arctic Circle because the Earth is rotating. Now the idea that somehow the polar cap would rotate down here by Canada, well, what happens when the Earth rotates and now the polar cap's over here? It's in full sunlight. The only way that this works is that the caps are at the North and South Pole. The difference between the June solstice and the December solstice is only the size of these polar caps. So when the sun's down here in the southern hemisphere, the polar cap will get larger up here. And the, and the Antarctic cap will get smaller. And when the sun is up here in June, the opposite occurs. The polar cap down in the southern hemisphere will be larger and the one in the northern hemisphere will be smaller. It's ludicrous to even consider it being out here. I guess a lot of people have had questions about the sun as it appears to move throughout the celestial sky. If you take a look here, I drew some green sight lines from the Earth, and I put those three little squares in the back, the red, the white, and the yellow. And you'll notice that as the Earth moves, so too does our sight line, which they call parallax. So this is something that I wanted to show because it is possible that many of you globe trotters don't know what you believe. So you'll notice that easily seen there in this little depiction, the sight line moves. Next, I'm going to show you what you actually believe. You have to believe that the sight line, as shown here in the bottom left, never moves. Meaning, see all those sight lines, the blue lines that go through, we got two going through the green box, two going through the red box, and one going through the yellow. Imagine that no matter where the Earth goes, even though it travels 500 miles, I'm sorry, 500 million miles uh, around the sun, it never changes its parallax. So you'll see I just swung the Earth out a little bit to the right there and added the gray sight lines, and look how much it changes. No longer are any of the boxes being hit by the same sight line, yet in all the travels of the Earth, the stars remain exactly fixed. fixed. Well, to answer this question, let me show you this classic example of curvature of the Earth. This is the CN Tower from Niagara, New York, across Lake Erie. It's 39 miles. Now, I want you to look at where that CN Tower is, and imagine that you're standing right there, and look at the angle that you would have to look at that tower from the beach. Now take one step to the left, and with your eye, tell me the difference in the angle. Now here's the problem with people making statements like the stars don't shift in their position based on where we are in the orbit, so therefore the Earth is flat. They have absolutely no concept of the distances involved. This is an American football field. It's 100 yards from goal line to goal line. If we make that 100 yards the distance from the sun to the earth, the sun will be a ball about 30 inches in diameter and the earth will be about the size of a marble on the opposite goal line. How far do you think it is to the nearest star? Let's look. Okay, so right here in the middle of the screen, you can see that football stadium. Let's draw a line to the same scale 
to the nearest star. Now we're going to head on down here to Perth, Australia and keep going. That's 15,000 miles to the nearest star. Well guys, that's the first part of this two-part episode. We're going to talk about perspective and space travel in the next one.